Okay. Good afternoon. It's afternoon, Friday. Time for Romans again. And uh, so we've been kind of busy this morning, so we didn't get this recorded until now. Verla and Kevin helped me build, uh, in fact, they did a lot of it, the uh, more bookshelves. We had books piled over uh, everything, books piled on books, so this helped a lot. And uh, um, we had some maple and some oak that we had made. You, we were using it to make uh, cutting boards out of. So anyway, that's an, an improvement. And the next big step here is that we just got UPS to a, uh, a new desk here that we're going to have to take everything off of put, and put the new one on because the new one is motorized. So it can, you can stand up and work. I'm finding out that having most of my work uh, in a sitting down at a desk position doesn't help your body any. So anyway, maybe sometimes we'll do some Bible studies standing up. I don't know how that'll work, but um, anyway, that's what's been going on here. And um, so let's pray and we'll get back into Romans chapter three. Father, we ask your presence with us now by your spirit as always we depend upon you to illumine our minds that we might uh, understand the truths of your word which are foolishness to the natural man but but they are wisdom to those who are spiritual those that you've you've given new minds and hearts and cause to be born again so we thank you for that all those things father and pray that you would teach us now from your word and enable us to have stronger faith and a greater love for you and we pray this in christ's name amen all right then i wanted to talk just before we start um well we're already starting but um my uh I have a point for showing you this. this. This shelf right here of books. Can they see my hand here, Verla? Uh, this shelf right here up to, where does it come? Clear up here to this point, all this back. That's all Martin Lloyd-Jones books. Big part of it is his big uh, commentary set on Romans and then an eight volume set on, um, on Ephesians. Um, and then the top up here is uh, um, John Calvin and then John Bunyan here. Now, the reason I'm pointing all that out to you is not to say, oh, see how many books I've got. Um, and by the way, in doing that with all these books, don't even think that I've even begun to read them all. So, uh, but at any rate, what, what I wanted to mention to you is that um, and, and I didn't have room for uh, uh, J.C. Ryle. He's, he's back there. Maybe I'll be able to work him in somewhere there. But I want you to think about this. Martin Lloyd-Jones books, right? J.C. Ryle. Um, uh, Bunyan, really, too. John Bunyan. John Calvin, these books up here are all the sermons, uh, not all of John Calvin's sermons, but all those books are John Calvin sermons. Is this other set down here, big long one, is uh, his commentaries. But here's what I've found over the years, and I wish I would have been taught it in seminary. Maybe you have to learn it for yourself or whatever. But you've got, and we've been using them in this study, You've got commentaries, and you've got the sermons of Lloyd-Jones here. So here's Commentary Excellent by William Hendrickson on Romans. Um, Lloyd-Jones's books, such as on Ephesians and his set on Romans, are not properly commentaries as such. They're, they are his sermons. Now, there's a difference, and... And it's an important difference. The, um, a commentary certainly has its place, absolutely. Some commentaries are, 
are uh, better than others in, in, in this respect. William Hendrickson's pretty good. But let's talk about a commentary, for example. A commentary will, generally speaking, spend some time giving you an introduction to the, you know, the authorship of it, how we know the book belongs in the Bible, um, the date that it was written to, who it was written to, all those kinds of things. And then it gets right into it, right? Verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 1. And so the way that most commentaries are set out, um, for instance here, we'll find all right, so here's one here. This will be uh, Romans 1, verse, um, let's see here, yeah, 32. And so you see in bold face there has the text of the verse, of the scripture, that one verse. And then underneath it, of course, is the um, commentator's, inter uh, not interpretation, uh, well, I guess in, in a way, what he's doing in his comments is he's telling us what the verse says, okay? That's what it does. The commentary tells us what the verse says, <clears throat> what it means, you know, you know, what is the ordinance of God? Uh, what does it mean to be worthy of death? And, and so on. And so, and it'll give some different viewpoints and, and sometimes and then and comment. Now, the better commentaries, which are more profitable, are not only accurate in their interpretation of a verse and their explanation of a verse, but they also include at least a bit of preaching. Now, the difference between <clears throat> preaching, a sermon, and a strict commentary, for example, is that a commentary proper uh, wants to look maybe at, at the Greek words behind the English and what do the words mean, give you the meaning. There, we understand what Paul was saying, then let's move on. Now, <clears throat> a very academic, intellectual type commentary, that's all it'll do. It'll stop there. Fortunately, fortunately, commentators like Hendrickson don't do that. They, they, they are always helping us say, well, what does that mean then? And what, how do, what does this mean for our lives? Uh, <clears throat> you know, to apply it to ourselves and really ultimately then being giving glory and praise to God for, the, for that truth and so on, okay? Um, Lloyd-Jones's... Um, set, for example, on Romans or on Ephesians, as I said, they're sermons. They're strictly his, um, like in the Romans set that went on for years on Friday nights that he was preaching um, through Romans, 350 some sermons. There was a lady there, he gives her name somewhere here at the beginning, who she would take the, rec they were recording his sermons, but she would take those recordings and transcribe them. And it's those that are largely there word for word what he preached. And in fact, you can follow his audio of his sermons on Lloyd-Jones Trust and open up the book here and you pretty much follow it word for word here. So he's preaching. If I had a choice, <clears throat> well, let me put it this way. The reason over the years I mean, I've bought so many books that I didn't need, right? I never used, still got some floating around here. It doesn't mean that they're not good. But I don't find, the ones that I find the most profitable are, for example, J.C. Ryle. Why? Because even on his um, expositions and commentaries on the four Gospels, he's preaching. He, he brings it home and applies it, shows us this this is what we are meant to not only understand, but to, but to do, right? And, uh, and, and so he does that. In Calvin's sermons, and you've heard me say before, people that badmouth John Calvin and just think he's so detestable and so forth, I guarantee you 
They've never read him, and they certainly have never read his sermons. But his sermons are extremely valuable, all right? I mean, they're sermons. They're, they're common. You're learning, you're learning what the Scripture means, and at the same time, um, how we are to react to it, right? And, and do I need to be convicted of sin? Am I even saved? Do I need to examine myself? Um, do, do I, should I be giving some glory to God here at that point? That's what, that's what sermons do. Um, and then, uh, okay, John Bunyan, same thing. Same kind of a thing there if you read his sermons and his, and his works there. Um, so why am I telling you this? If, if you took the published works of J.C. Ryle and the published uh, works of Martin Lloyd-Jones, all right, and just those two, you could stop right there, all right, but, but say you got a few volumes for yourself of, of the sermons of... of um, John Calvin, and you just began, open your Bible, it's like we're doing here, right? That's what we're doing largely in our study of Romans. Open your Bible, happens to be on the computer here, but you open there our Bible, and then we look at it, and we are, um, we open up commentaries and and, uh, and some of, and, and a lot of times we're relying on Martin Lloyd-Jones and his sermons there. And we go through it verse by verse by verse. And if you use these kinds of tools, all right, J.C. Ryle, Martin Lloyd-Jones, sermons of John Calvin, John Bunyan, if that, if those people's works are the only books you have in your library and you diligently apply yourself to them, I guarantee you, I promise you, you will be so far ahead spiritually of, of the most intense degree of, uh, from a seminary, you'd be so far ahead of that that it, it, it's hard to really um, explain it to you. They're, they are, um, and you know, if you think about the Apostle Paul, for instance, just take the Apostle Paul, take, um, and take Romans, all right? Isn't it true? Isn't it true that what Paul is doing is preaching in his letters? That's what he's doing. These are these are, are, are sermons, and he makes specific application. Now, here's, here's the tragedy of it. When I was in seminary, I, I was never introduced to a single one of these guys. Not a single one. It was, it, it's hard to explain. I got, for all the thousands and thousands of dollars and all of the time and years put in, um, I learned some Greek I learned some biblical theology in one class, but the rest of it, I, I don't even, I don't even use. You see, so, um, so there's just a tip, and if you want to just start off, you know, start off simple. Buy, start buying. You buy them one volume at a time. Martin Lloyd Jones commentaries and so on, and or his. I call them commentaries, but on Romans or Ephesians, and uh, start going through them. Turn on YouTube and go to Martin Lloyd-Jones Trust. Open your Bible and listen to Martin Lloyd-Jones teach you as he's preaching right through those, those very uh, verses. And so yeah, almost all of his, uh, his books that I've got up here, they're all... They're all sermons, you know. Here's one here, preaching and preachers, and that's all that is is sermons that he delivered um, on that on that subject. So um, anyway, 
words of wisdom, and especially if there's a, boy, if there was ever a, a young person or anybody really feeling, feeling called into ministry, I just say, don't, don't waste your money, really, don't waste your money on uh, a seminary education and then think that, think that you, you, I mean, what a, what a disaster it is that uh, it took me years and years and years before I ever even heard of, of Martin Lloyd-Jones. And so, um, all right, well, with all of that said, let's continue here then. And um, we, I'm not, we're in this section of verses 9 through 20 of chapter 3. And you remember the heading here of it is no one is righteous, okay? There it is. There's the, the start of the gospel. You've got to get this down first before anything, before anything else, okay? Um, no one is righteous. When, uh, apart from Christ, when we were born into this world, we were born dead in sin, and we remained that way until Christ saved us. And if anyone that's ever ever listens to any of these messages, these videos, and uh, you're not born again, you know, don't. Why would you want to be afraid to ask that question? You know, how am I sure I'm born again? All right, you better know now, right? So, um, I, I just had a friend. Uh, she'll be listening to this, I'm sure. But I just had a friend uh, a few states away from us here text me today and say that her unsaved mother is in hospice and just that close to dying in fact and she uh she insisted that the roman catholic priest be brought in and so my friend was there and here comes the my friend's a christian but in comes the roman catholic priest and he pronounces her absolved of her sins absolved of her sins you see so here she is. She may have died by now, by now anyway. But, but, um, and here it is. The best she can hope. What, what, what's the best Rome can give her besides a false absolution of sin? Huh? Right? Purgatory. Okay. Now you're 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 off to pur to purgatory. If you've believed anybody that's believed a lie, better find out. Better find out now because uh, once the bridegroom comes and closes the door, that's it. Um, that, that's it. No, no second chance here. So, Okay, well, but let's read this then. Um, everybody is under condemnation, under God's wrath. That's why we need <coughs> Christ. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. Uh, and by the way, we, we say, are we even Christians any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged. My brain is wandering. Now we're in the New American Standard. See, that's where that ESV added the word Jew in there. And they, that probably not exactly what Paul meant. Okay, what then? Are we Christian? Am I as a Christian saying that we're better than everybody else? No, not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it's written, there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There's none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, <clears throat> this is not a pretty picture, but then sin isn't pretty. And uh, this is what happened when sin entered the world and we've already looked at what it means there's none righteous there's not a single person since adam uh 
besides Christ, of course, but I mean a human being that, not the God-man, but a human being, there's not a single one ever been born that is in a right standing with God. They are in an, all of us, enter this world, fallen world, in sin, under the God's wrath because we are ungodly and unrighteous. And as we've heard <coughs> the point made before, um, this, this whole section ends up in 19 and 20, which we'll have to look at um, in the future here, but so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. And we, we said, really, here's the bottom line. If a person's mouth isn't shut, which is to say, to just put it plainly, if a person has not shut up with what? Excuses. Oh, oh, I'm, you know, I've got this excuse, or God is love, he'll, he'll cut me some slack on that. On and on and on it goes, you know. I'm, I'm basically good. God knows that and, and so forth. Um, and, and all of those excuses, excuses, excuses. If a, person's, uh, if a person's mouth isn't shut, what does that mean? When a, when a guilty person stands before a judge, and the judge says, do you have anything to say to these charges? And that person, it, well, what normally happens? Oh, all kinds of excuses here and there and so forth. And, and they deserve mercy and what it goes. A truly repentant mercy, a person, their mouth is shut. I mean, at the most, they would say, Your Honor, I, I have nothing to say. I'm guilty. I have no excuses. And uh, I, I, deserve, I deserve the condemnation verdict of this, of this court. And there's lots and lots of people who claim to be Christians today who are still running off at the mouth with excuses. I mean, you can go through these verses right in front of us here. Um, there's none righteous, not even one. And you can, there's none who understand, none who seeks for God. You can go through those verses, open a Bible up, <laughs> show them, look, look at these verses. Is that what this says? Yeah. But their mouth isn't closed. They're still, they're still making excuses. The excuse will either center on themselves, I'm not that bad, or it will center on God or both. Or God, God oh, well, God's not. Oh, this wrath thing. Uh, God is love, you know. He's not gonna, he's not gonna come down on us that that hard it's not all that bad but it is that bad in fact it's it's worse there's none righteous not even one and so um <clears throat> here in we're at verse 13 and re remember now that's why the nasb has these in all capital letters because they're quotes from the old testament mostly from the psalms um, i think there's one from isaiah but their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So, because the sinner is ungodly, by nature, ungodly, opposed to God, right? Not characterized by godliness, um, un ungodliness, because of that, their deeds are unrighteous. Unrighteous. They're not righteous deeds. They are unrighteous. And Paul's just given us some examples here, right? Um, and the first one, as far as their deeds go, that he points out is what? The words, sins of the mouth. Out of the mouth comes what? What's in our heart. Their throat is an open grave. Um, Lloyd-Jones emphasized the fact that that would bring up the fact that, uh, you know, here's this rotting corpse that's not covered up and just rotten and putrid. And that's what man's in his sin, that's what his speech is like. 
I wonder if you couldn't also take it this way. I mean, all of that is no doubt true, but <clears throat> what's an open grave? It's, it's something that's ready to swallow up somebody in death, right? So, and, and that kind of relates to the poison of asps is under their lips. Um, we I did an interview not long ago at America Out Loud where uh, we were discussing the subject that abuse, like domestic violence or people that are revilers and this kind of a thing, sociopaths, um, abuse, and let's just talk about verbal abuse, okay, verbal abuse, it's murder. Abuse is murder. Uh, it's protracted homicide that words have, um, what is that? What's that old saying that's so stupid and false? Sticks and stones. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Who was the knucklehead that ever dreamt that up? You know, apparently they'd never been targeted b before. I would just reverse that. Most people who have been the targets and victims of a sociopath, for instance, would tell you they would rather the guy is assaulting them with sticks and stones rather than the, the words. You know, Verl and I have been watching um, a lot of uh, BBC programs of uh, productions of Charles Dickens, all right? Charles Dickens, now to my knowledge, he wasn't a Christian, but boy, when it came to human nature and understanding uh, um, a sociopath or these kind of people, abusers and so on, he had them pegged. And if you if you want to if you want to see these kinds of guys with people with poison of asps under their lips, just watch some uh, just watch some of those BBCs of uh, Charles Dickens. But but here's the point: it's not just sociopaths and others. This is us. This is sin. It doesn't mean that every human being is as bad as they could be. We aren't all sociopaths, right, or psychopaths. We're not all um, domestic abusers and so on. But have you ever sinned with your words? I mean, anybody that says, no, I've never done that, well, you just did. Uh, that's called a lie. Uh, you, you can't, um, our words demonstrate, um, for instance, let's take it this way. You ever thought about vulgar and profane speech, profanity, right? Filthy language that is just abounding all around us and more and more today. You ever thought about that? Where does this come from? Well, it comes from the heart. Words, uh, I'll put it this way. Profanity is the language of the old man. And if what kind of words are... Um, are called profanity, profane. What are they? They're ugly, they're stinking, they're, they describe shocking, disgusting, immoral things, right? That's what this profanity business does. Why is that? Because it's the language of the old man. That's who we are, born into this world. That's why the most pious person in the world uh, there's no way that they could ever say, oh, I never said or even thought a swear word, right? That kind of a thing. That would, that would be a lie. There's something wrong with our words. There's something wrong with when we use our, what does James say? He spends a lot of time on that, right? That our, the tongue is set on fire by hell um, with the same mouth we bless God and curse man and so on there's something wrong and it's called and it's called sin and he's so Paul is using the scriptures the word of God the Old Testament to convict us and show us this this is true there's deception um, the poison of asps it's under their lips okay like those folded up fangs of a poisonous snake it's un you don't just see it, but boy, when they lash out, here comes the poison. And wicked 
people are are deceiving. The sinner is 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 deceiving, you see. His mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So, you know, you, you just you hear people uh, blaspheme the Lord's name and and uh, or <laughs> and drive down the highway until you see some road rage, right? And talk about cursing and, and bitterness and so on. We've grown too accustomed to this thing because we live in a fallen world. But the, the, the fact that human beings' words are like this are, um, boy, the political scene's devolving into that kind of a thing. Now, it's not just some kind of heated debate or something. It's like these uh, ugly, ugly cursing words and, and uh, um, if words could kill, right? So, And then next, in verse 13, or 15, what else is true about man the sinner? His feet are swift to shed blood, right? He runs, he's anxious, he's eager when prodded by the right thing or person or whatever. I'll kill you, you know. His feet, and all you have to do is look at the history of the human race, study Western civilization, Eastern civilization, whatever you want, and it's it's a bloodbath. It's it's uh, you know, wars, constant, constant war, swift to shed to shed blood, right? Ready to ready to kill, and so much of that in our own nation today. Um, some of it is even some of these things we're looking at here. You'll even find them in churches. You ever, if you've ever been, there's some ugly scenes in in churches at so-called uh, annual meetings. Of, you know the membership, and I mean, some of that it's got so so nasty. But um, um, destruction and misery are in their paths. Just think about if you've seen. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, movies, old movies, for instance, of uh, the aftermath of the bombing of London or the bombing of uh, Berlin in, in, you know, the aftermath of, of World War II and so forth. Destruction, misery, famine, death, you know, wherever the sinner goes, the, wherever mankind goes, that's, he's, he's got a wide swath or path of destruction and misery. The path of peace they have not known. If there's anything that should characterize Christians, the genuine Christian church, it's peace. Being diligent, we've seen that in our Ephesian study, being diligent to preserve the bond of peace, right? The bond of peace that the Holy Spirit produces. But man in his sin, think about man's efforts to achieve peace world peace you hear people say oh i say a prayer for world world peace well <clears throat> the problem is these kind of people whose feet are swift to shed blood whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness they're not going to establish peace they don't even they don't know what what peace is is like even you see so and that's not just nationally or in the world but it's it's individually there there is what is this the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt there is no peace says the lord for the wicked there is there isn't any there is no no peace and why is the what is the root of the whole thing well, that's where Paul gives us the punchline here in verse 18. What's the reason for all this? Because there is no fear of God before their eyes, right? There's no fear 
of God before their eyes. Now, you can go, Lloyd-Jones does a really good job in his sermon on this text. And as I said, you can go to YouTube, go to Martin Lloyd-Jones Trust there, look for it, you can listen to it, and, uh, or just go online to their website. You can listen to his message on Romans 3, um, 18, this very thing here. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now think of this. We know, for example, in, well, let's look at it here, okay. Uh, move back to Proverbs. Opening lines of Proverbs here, okay. Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, if a person is going to be wise, all right, with, with God's wisdom, but just like, you see, look at how, look at the fool, okay? Man's, man is swift to shed blood. He, um, his mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. The poison of asps is under his tongue. His, his words are deceiving. What is the profit in that? You think about it. You know, peace is profitable. When there's peace, nations and people are they're able to thrive. What profit is there? in in that wickedness but but in order to um, pursue peace it ha we have to begin with the fear of the lord all right that's that's the start the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge and there's probably numbers of other places in in the bible that that say that very thing yeah here look at Psalm 111, verse 10. It's, I mean, it's all over the place. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So what is the fear of the Lord? Here's the sinners. Here's man the sinner's um, fundamental issue. At the root of the whole thing is, he has no fear of God. What is the fear of, God, of the Lord? What does that mean? The fear of the Lord, well, let, let's go back to, to it here. And uh, bring this back. Here we go. There's no fear of God. Notice it says before their eyes. The fear of God includes things like acknowledging God, acknowledging Him, um, acknowledging that He is God and I'm not. He is the Creator. I'm the creature. He is to be worshipped. No creature is to be worshipped. All those things are entailed in fearing God. In addition, it would, the fear of God would include an awareness of the fact that God is holy and there is such a thing as his wrath. And, uh, and to understand that, we are all going to stand before him one day to give, to give an, an account, you see. Um, but the sinner, man in his sin, he has none of that. None of that. So you can think, for example, think of your unsaved neighbor, for example. Maybe a, a nice enough person and so forth. But he or she, they don't live their daily life with the fear of God. Um, and no, look at it, it says, before their eyes, constantly in front of them, recognizing that everything they see around them is from God, the, the trees, the rivers, the animals, our food and clothing, it all comes from God. That, that, that's, 
acknowledging that, things like that, um, is what it means to have God in front of you so that whichever way you turn, he's there. You see him and you acknowledge him. What's that other Proverbs here? Uh, let's see, Proverbs 3, 5, is it? Yeah, look at this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. See, this is... Uh, this is a perfect description, definition of what it means to fear God. Trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. So a person that fears the Lord will turn away from evil, and their eyes will be upon the Lord. They won't be wise in their own eyes. They will look to the Lord for wisdom. They will acknowledge, in all their ways, acknowledge Him. A person that fears the Lord acknowledges, admits, confesses the fact that God is everywhere and that He is a sovereign, that He answers prayer that he, um, he is to be consulted. His word is to be, is to be consulted. Um, before we do things, we, I think, well, let's just stop here. What does God say about which way I should go here? All of these things have to do with um, the, fear, the fear of the Lord, you see. But if you take somebody such as the sinner, right, there is no fear, not a little bit of fear. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So I, I like to go locally here to a uh, um, little, little store in our, in our community, and, and uh, I run into people down there, and I've, I've met them, and I try to introduce myself to people and so forth, and in, in, in this little community, it's kind of a just kind of a good way to to meet people and so on. But anyway, um, you go in there, and and pretty often, pretty often, it happened just the other day. Somebody will just be in there. Some some guy, older guy, say, uh, you know, one customer that was in there, and he doesn't he didn't know me. I later introduced myself to him, but he I didn't tell him I was a pastor or anything, but I just, uh, but it just in his conversation, he's blaspheming the Lord's name. I mean, left and right, he's, he's doing it. There's no fear of the Lord in that man. If there were, he'd be shaken in his boots and he'd be, oh man, that evilness came out of my mouth. I have to repent of that, you know. No fear of God. But that's typical, typical of the sinner. And this is the 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 basis you might say of sin of sin there's no fear of god people don't fear god look at what's going on in our nation today look at how people are living in perversions and immorality and uh um just scorning god there's no fear of god before their before their eyes well, then, we'll plan to look at verses 19 and 20 next time, which is the culmination of this section, which began clear back at verse 18 when Paul said that, that uh, man is under the wrath of God. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, right? And so, and so here is the mess that the sinner is in, and this is all really part of the gospel, which begins with this bad news, to bring us hopefully to this point that the sinner's mouth is closed. Quit making excuses, and he recognizes he's accountable to God, and he's in a mess, and he's headed for hell. And there's nothing 
he can do about it. Where is his help going to come from? And that's what Paul is about to get into. Father, we thank you for these truths. It's an <clears throat> ugliness of sin, and yet we have to know these things. We have to see our sin if, before we're ever going to want to hear about a Savior. And so, uh, Father, we, we thank you for speaking the truth to us that we might, that we might turn to Christ and be saved. And we pray, Father, for all the myriads of unsaved people that we know, neighbors, family members, and relatives, and, and friends, and co-workers. We're living in a time when it just seems like so rare to hear of anyone that is even thinking about, about you and about the judgment to come. And, and so, Father, we pray that you might give us opportunity as you work in people's hearts, that they might ask us, ask us um, what the hope of the gospel is, and we might be able to tell them. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.